Hi, everyone. I'm Francois Picard in Paris. And I'm Melinda Crane in Berlin. A drastic rise in hunger, over a billion informal workers facing unemployment, and up to a hundred million people pushed into extreme poverty. Those are the latest grim projections of Corona's worldwide impact. We're talking about a killer virus that spread across the globe in days, a livelihoods the world over uh, that have been uh, shut down. But is there an opportunity here? Can those livelihoods be restored in a more equitable, in a more sustainable manner? Just as an EU summit bargains over the recovery plan, the United Nations is staging a conference that's talking about building back better. Our title, a green and better recovery for all. France 24 and DWTV join up for the debate. Welcome. And it is a pleasure to introduce our guests, starting with the finance minister of Ghana, Ken Ofori-Atta. François Germain is a lead author for the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change at the United Nations, lecturer at the French Political Science Institute Sciences Po. Your books uh, include The Anthropocene and the Global Environmental Crisis. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. And it's a pleasure to welcome Sunita Narain. She is an environmental <laughs> activist and director of the Center for Science and Environment in Delhi, India. And before we take a closer look at the pandemic's toll in the Global South, we'd like to ask the three of you to tell us, and really in one sentence, if you would, is green recovery even still an option in the wake of Corona? Sunita, if you would go first, please. Um, it's possible, but it's a challenge. And let's recognize the nature of the challenge. The fact is very poor people have been affected they're desperate for growth, but there's also a possibility because we, we can invest in local resilient futures for the poor in the world. And that's the opportunity that should excite us, that should help us to build for a greener, cleaner future. And Minister Ofori Atta, your answer, still possible? Thank you very much. I, I strongly believe so. I mean, I think if we can um, sort of turn our heads into an um, economics of uh, mutuality where the issue of power and resources is not what drives where we are going. We have easily about a hundred trillion dollars of assets under management and the question is really allocation and redeployment as opposed to a lack of resources. So it is possible if we are ready for a tectonic shift uh, in the global financial architecture. Thank you. And Francois Germain, you wrote not too long ago uh, that in the long run, the COVID crisis will be a disaster for the climate. So do you think green recovery is even still an option? I think it is still possible, but we need to admit that this is not the direction that we're taking at the moment. I think this is an opportunity uh, that we would be stupid and sorry to waste. Not the direction we're taking at the moment. Uh, it's uh, when you take a look at the developing world, in particular countries like India, where the pandemic is still raging, but where there was first that brutal uh, lockdown that came all of a sudden and left uh, millions of people uh, caught off guard. Now, as the economy reopens, you see that desperate rush to get things back to where they were before. It's a report by France 24 correspondent Mandakini Gala. Every morning, these men assemble on a street in New Delhi, looking for somebody to hire them for the day to do jobs like painting, repairing or carpentry. If they're lucky, they could earn up to eight euros a day. But lately, luck hasn't been on their side. The lockdown has hit the construction industry hard, and it's men like Feroz who are paying the price for it. Like millions before him, Feroz too is considering returning to his village where he can live off the land. But the exodus of such migrant workers has plunged India's industrial sectors into crisis like this garment manufacturing unit on the outskirts of Delhi. 
at the peak of our season, we used to have around 550 people. Today, we are working with 144 people all together. With manufacturers struggling to find workers, many states have introduced laws that temporarily dissolve labor rights to ensure industries don't collapse. As the workforce is very, very limited, they used to work for eight hours a shift. Now we have to ask them at least they have to work at least 10 hours or 11 hours. But those who stay on are focused on survival, not on the battle for labor rights. When we were working first, we were going to get out of our work. Now we have to work more and more. We have to get out of our work. We have to get out of our work. With no fixed income, no savings and a disrupted marketplace, India's millions of migrant and daily wage workers face an uncertain future. As does the country's economy, which in the absence of the migrant labor force is expected to grow at its lowest pace in 11 years. Sundita Narayan, we, we see in that report uh, how both uh, the formal and the informal sector are being directly impacted. Again, it comes back to Melinda's initial question of uh, what kind of recovery when you see that report? See, in front of what's important for us to recognize is two things. One, definitely the COVID-19 has hit the poorest the worst. They're hit twice. One, because they are most vulnerable to the infection. And two, because of the loss of livelihoods. But there's also something very interesting and important that is happening today in our world. The fact is, till now, we have had massive migration from our villages into our cities because both because of agrarian distress and the growing risks because of climate change you are finding people leaving their homes in desperation and that's why you've had massive exodus out to villages into cities what covid has done for the first time is actually sent people back it's a reverse migration and you're seeing today, therefore, the possibility. And this is where we are stressing there is a possibility. Two things are possible. One, if we invest in rural economies, build the resilience of people, invest in natural resource management in rural areas, you can actually build for conditions so that people can live um, at home. They can live in their villages, live with well-being. That's one. Two. The fact is, till now, we have had this atrocious globalization system in which the world has built uh, an economy by discounting both labor and the environment, which is why you have these atrocious labor conditions in our cities, because everybody needs to compete with China, everywhere else in the world where you want to keep the costs lower. Today, with the exodus of labor, for the first time in India, there is a discussion about how labor rights need to be, because industry needs that labor. They will have to give higher wages to the labor. They will have to give housing to the labor. Now, that will mean increased uh, cost of production. So is there an opportunity for the world to talk about a different model of growth, moving away from consumption-led growth, cheap, obsolete production to well-being led group. I don't know, but this is really where the question is today. And that's what you're seeing playing out in India. At the height of lockdown back in April, Kenna Foriata, you uh, wrote a blog, uh, a, 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 a diary, if you will, for the Financial Times, which you described driving through a, a day in your life, driving through the city of Accra. And you wrote, where are the school children, the women frying donuts? The newspaper sellers, the beggars, where are our youth selling everything from dog chains to gum? Has Ghana also experienced this reverse migration that Sunita Narayan was talking about? Um, you know, I think um, our president um, sort of saw the situation very clearly. And right from the beginning, you know, he asked us at the ministry, um, to launch a hundred million dollar preparedness program. Um, so in, when the lockdown came, as I described it, uh, we were ready for that. And working with the faith-based organizations, we're able to then supply food, we're able to give free electricity and free water, just to make sure that people's livelihoods were protected and also protection for the health workers. 
So, so I think we, we took that quite well and that therefore um, sort of managed the situation. We didn't have that sort of huge reverse migration to the villages, et cetera, and we were able to keep the body and soul together uh, in Accra. Um, so, and then the issue of the testing and getting into the environment um, to make sure that people felt safe and was also done. It came at extreme cost, um, but his mantra was, you know, we know we are competent to bring the economy back to life, but we are not able to bring people back to life. And so let's do all that we can. Um, so I think if you look at Africa, we have done the most testing, the incidence rates are reasonably low, um, but it has stretched the treasury and therefore reimagining how to um, work with our finances is what is required um, for the world. But I keep saying that truly we need to move as a continent um, from this um, economics of power and commodities and resources into a certain kind of mutuality um, that really uh, we have enough resources to go around and whether we can find the type of leadership at this time. Um, mutuality, be a, mutuality between whom? Some of mutuality between um, currently those who have the resources. Uh, for example, uh, the OECD countries have been able to print money and spend about $11 trillion uh, to be able to get the economies going. And that toolkit is not available to most people in Africa. However, there's over $100 trillion of assets under management performing at subpar levels. What is the new tectonic shift that is required so that this redistribution uh, can happen in which global prosperity will come into being and then save the environment for the future? Um, so those are the questions that we have and our president has written to a few of the leading presidents and I'm in discussions with the US on these issues as chairman of the Development Committee of the World Bank. We, we want to come back in just a moment to those questions of mutuality and North-South cooperation, but let me just uh, drill a little bit deeper now on the migration issue that Sunita uh, raised. She sees a process of reverse migration going on, and we're certainly seeing that in other places as well. Recent media reports in the U.S. show that workers from, uh, from Latin America and from other countries are saying, you know, maybe it's time to go home. We can't make a livelihood in the United States. Francois Jovin, you've done a lot of work on migration. Would you say, in fact, that that process is a process that in the medium and long term can lead to real changes in the conditions for workers, or is it a temporary phenomenon? I think, I think it is a possibility. Obviously, that's still too early to tell. Uh, but what, what is for sure is that we've observed migration flows that were very different from what we used to observe. As Sunita Narain mentioned, there was a massive reverse migration from the cities to the countryside that was observed in India and in many developing countries, but also in Europe. If I take the case of, of Paris, for example, more than one billion people left the region of Paris during the lockdown because they wanted to go uh, to the countryside. So that we, we saw a kind of rural exodus re in reverse. Uh, and that's interesting to see if that will, if this is a trend that will continue in the long run. Then uh, I think it's important that many citizens from industrialized countries were also stuck at home and, and, and so important restrictions to their mobility. And in a way, uh, they felt the restrictions that they had imposed to migrants from developing countries for years and all of a sudden they were no longer welcome in other countries including in the us in the case of europeans and i think that is something that can also uh, in the long run affect the relationship and the migration flows and then there is also the issue that uh, migrants were really on the front line during this crisis that they were usually more exposed to the virus that typically the mortality rate was much higher amongst migrant population compared to native populations. And clearly we saw an important array of inequalities in access to health, uh, in access to health facilities that really affected the migrants. And indeed, this is also likely that, means that this might affect uh, the migration flows and the migration policies in the future, because we saw how important and how essential the migrant workers were to the economy. 
final point, and we'll have the figures at the end of this year, uh, the income available for many migrants was also significantly cut, which means that the amount of remittances that would, they will be able to send back home to their families that represented more than $500 billion last year is likely to be reduced significantly this year, which will affect the resources available to many families in the global south. And we know that a lot of countries, a lot of families depend on these remittances for their livelihoods. All of the circumstances that we are discover, d discussing have many young people the world over worried about their future. Let's hear now from a few of the youth delegates to the United Nations High Level Political Forum that is meeting this week to talk about accelerating action on sustainable development. In the context of recovering greener and better, uh, are the EU and Germany assessing their recovery measures through a climate justice lens? If so, what concrete actions will your government take to help those affected the most by the climate crisis? My question is, can I have a quality education after this COVID-19? How can we ensure that a green recovery in the post-COVID-19 era addresses poverty alleviation and also offers an opportunity for employment for many unemployed youth, especially in the global south? Post-COVID, as it affects young people, with the rising unemployment across the world, what will be the role of innovation or what should be government's uh, plan in ensuring that innovation becomes the new creativity to uh, change the narrative of how normal would be normal? Minister Ofori Atta, let me pick up on the last three uh, questions that we heard there. First of all, uh, what would you say to those young people who are worried about their generation's educational opportunities and employment prospects in light of the crisis? Um, I think it's, um, it's a great question and that's what really um, keeps all of us at wake at night uh, because I mean, in Ghana, I, I think um, uh, the youth population um, between 18 and 35 uh, represents some um, 35 to 40 percent uh, of our population and therefore all we do is how do you create an environment and in which the appropriate skills will be given and there will be social mobility that, that is key to any sustaining democracy um, so we have since we came uh, into government initiated a free education policy for senior high school uh, which has brought about 1.2 million um, kids who otherwise would not have gone to senior high school now going through the system. Um, and that therefore is widening sort of the skill set and therefore programming us for an accelerator industrialization program. So with this um, COVID issue, um, we are just putting together um, 100 billion CD, which is about a quarter of our GDP um, program uh, for stabilization and revitalization so that we can crank up even at this time the whole issue um, of recovery in a much faster way. And so we are quite optimistic um, that we are addressing the issue head on and it now leads to, as you said, ingenuity and innovation on our part to find the resources to do that. But I think in the past three years, we've laid the groundwork of an educated workforce which can then uh, flexibly used in the changing economy that we have. It's a tall order, but I think that is the, the reason for being in government and to give everybody a chance um, for their God-given skills to be used. Minister, just a really quick follow-up, if you would. You recently presented the African Development Bank's economic outlook for West Africa, which has some pretty harsh numbers in terms of the contraction of the economy. You said, nonetheless, you see this as an opportunity to, to harness Africa's youth bulge, as we call it, the fact that they have an, uh, Africa has an enormous uh, population of young people. But the fact is, up until now, Africa hasn't been very good at harnessing that youth bulge. There's a high rate of unemployment in many countries for young people. Is that really going to change in the wake of the crisis? I mean, I, I don't, you know, I'm sort of eternally optimistic. You know, we inherited uh, a, a government in which um, deficits were like 9% and uh, inflation 15% and, you know, all the numbers were turning in the wrong direction. 
and we've been able to stabilize over the three years and still finance um, education and healthcare to a degree that has never been done before. And so for me, the issue is leadership and for African leadership to be strong on the international stage as to the way in which uh, we finance the world. And that's why I keep saying we need to really confront the issue of the international financial architecture because it's really not fit for purpose. You can have $100 trillion um, sitting not um, of subpar um, returns and then have a financing gap of about $100 billion a year for um, infrastructure for Africa. And then we say we don't have the money. You know, Africa Development Bank, as you know, is able to raise funds in international markets at about 0.75%. Um, and African countries raise money at 8%. The question then is, how do you create a system where you have uh, a triple A wraparound to ensure that we can also go to the capital markets at a good rate? So we get a sustainable means of financing for the world. Um, so yes, I think it can change. Uh, I think most leaders are beginning to realize the enormous power um, of our youth and what it means for the future. By 2050, we are going to be a quarter of the world's population with most of the youth. We need to address it. And it's in the world's you know, enlightened self-interest um, to work with us for that type of mutuality. Um, so I, I'm optimistic. Um, that the new type of leadership we are seeing on the continent, we can turn this into real good. Ndita Sanayin, what's interesting, listening both to those young people and to uh, uh, Minister Aforiata, is this is a moment where people need more government. Is that the case where you are? Are you asking me? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. It's a case where you need more government, but it's not just about government. It's about um, looking at a new compact between the urban and the rural, between the rich and the poor. And I think the minister talked about that. And that's really what I mean, I can already see my own government is beginning to talk this language and beginning to invest. Essentially, what you're saying today is that you have a massive you have a massive opportunity where you have very large numbers of young people uh, who need employment. But instead of looking only at the employment in the very formal sectors in the urban industrial areas, can you think about employment, which is very different, uh, which is available to where people live, uh, to build, uh, in a sense, the rural economic base, the resilience of the communities, because please, I mean, we must always remember that COVID-19 is the crisis and the disruption we are facing today. But we have an equally big disruption, which is already knocking on our doors, which is climate change. And we are seeing the impact of that on the lives of our farmers, of the poor in our country. So we have to invest. And this is where somewhere like India has, you know, this whole idea of a national employment guarantee scheme where everybody is guaranteed a right to employment. And there are certain days of employment that you're paid for. Now, till now, that scheme has been on subsistence basis, on the basis of saying we're putting a floor to poverty. But that same approach can be used and should be used. And, you know, many of us are advocating it. Government is talking about it where you could use that approach to really say we will pay for uh, creating employment and we will create that employment for productive regeneration of our natural resource base and of an economy which is resilient. And I think that's really where the nature of the new business has to be. It's a business unusual for a post-COVID world. We cannot talk about this in the same language. Yeah, and at a moment where uh, everybody's turning to those governments, again, as we said at the outset, there's that EU summit taking place this week, conditionalities on uh, how you disperse the giant aid package we're working on uh, is one of the things that everybody's paying attention to, and going green is in the mix. Now, the question that uh, DW's Marina Strauss put to the European Union's uh, environment uh, commissioner, 
Virginius uh, Sincivesius was, uh, does the global south factor in? Is it part of that mix when you're going green? We realize very clearly that we're not living in a vacuum and everything what happens uh, around the world affects us. And COVID-19 is a great proof of that. Maybe to someone it looked like it's a, some issue in China and in the end of the day it affected the whole planet. Same goes with the, with the other challenges we're facing, climate change. Uh, we can't ignore what's happening in uh, Siberia, uh, melting ice in uh, Antarctic or, or other regions. And clearly that only by leading uh, by example, setting high standards here within the EU and then of course exporting those other standards to uh, our partners, we can all achieve some tangible results. And it is very important to support them in that transition uh, because, as I said, we can cope very well here uh, with issues domestically, but if we won't help our partners in Africa, uh, Asia countries, uh, American countries, all those problems will, in the end of the day, will come back to us. So let's talk about what that means concretely. What are for you the key priorities, measures or projects to support a truly sustainable recovery in emerging economies and in developing countries? The first action which was important is, is, is budget. You can have uh, numerous declarations uh, and, 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 and maybe even, even plans, but if they're not followed with a sufficient budget, it's quite hard to implement. And I'm happy that uh, the Commission uh, in its uh, uh, proposal on, on a budget uh, dramatic, uh, dram dramatically increasing uh, funding uh, for uh, development projects, especially in Africa, uh, in Asian countries and America as well. Basically, we're trying uh, not to leave them behind and be ambitious only on our own, but truly to show that that agenda which we're applying here in the EU can be even faster and easier applied uh, in, in those regions uh, because they can, they can afford not to do mistakes we have made and not to lose any time. Ken Aforiata, when you listen to the European Commissioner there, how much are you, tell us the truth here, how much are you really banking on help from Brussels? Uh, you know, I, I, my, my suspicion after sort of being blessed of this opportunity in this seat, is that you see that even if um, trade was improved in a fair way by 1%, that's literally 70 billion new revenue. If um, illicit financial flows, of which commercial transactions of the West constitute most of it, is fixed, that's another $70 billion. Now, these numbers trump all the aid any of these uh, countries can give to us. So the, we, we come back to how do we look at this global economic structure such that people get what they are due and there will be no dependence. Um, so the challenge is drumming in, not what they are giving us, but really seeing whether the current landscape is fair. And that's the, the real fight because that becomes enduring that becomes sustainable, and that ensures that our green economies can come into being. And so um, I know that for the last uh, three months, we've been talking about whether there should be a debt freeze for Africa or debt relief. Is debt relief something that you feel is owed to the continent? Very interesting question. You know, when I, when I look at um, the rate at which I borrow, um, I borrow at about maybe 8%. I look at the rate at which Africa has defaulted financially, it's almost zero. However, I have this Africa risk premium that imposes almost six, 700 basis points on what I can borrow. Now, if I'm servicing, Africa is servicing debt today of about $44 billion a year, debt servicing. And you realize that if this was one or 2%, we actually will have to be paying about 15 billion. So you ask yourself, what is this 30 billion risk premium for? You know, and those become the fundamental challenges that we need to fight. You know, so that's so Ken Aforiata, that's Ken Aforiata, the finance minister speaking. 
What about Ken Aforiata, the former private banker? Would he agree with that? Well, the question really is, um, I mean, when you are structuring anything, you have to decide on the risk before you give the facility. And so my issue is, can we have, but you can also structure any product which has um, a wraparound you know, with a stronger balance sheet because you know that the risk you know, is containable. And we are asking, therefore, to create a special purpose vehicle for Africa in which we have a triple A wraparound so that we can have access to two or one percent financing. It's all in thinking big, thinking better, and just you know creating a world of mutuality. And so, so that's my fight for it. It's enough for Thank everybody. Let me ask uh, Francois Germain whether you think that the EU is truly serious about that mutuality when it comes to the global south. Europe's having trouble working out mutuality even within Europe amongst uh, northern EU member states and southern ones. Do you think they're really going to be equally ambitious about the global south? And if so, what carrots and sticks do they have available? Um. I think we need to recognize that so far the EU has often treated uh, the governments of the Global South as subcontractors rather than uh, as genuine partners. Uh, and I think uh, that the crisis possibly can lead uh, European governments to the realization that more cooperation will be needed. I have to say that my key concern uh, from this crisis, be it for migration policy or for climate policy, is that international cooperation might end up in tatters. Uh, we saw the paradox of this crisis is that it was a global crisis and yet it was met by very national responses with countries closing their borders to each other, stealing stocks of masks on, on, in airports um, and, and with international organizations and institutions uh, really lambasted uh, for the way they handled the crisis. And, you know, we can debate whether or not it is efficient to close the borders to stop the spread of the virus, but it is clear that closing the borders will not stop the spread of climate change and of greenhouse gas emissions. And therefore, to tackle uh, climate change, but also to tackle the green recovery and also to tackle other crises and other pandemics, we will need in the future more cooperation and less uh, nationalism. A and I think that it is an extremely important realization that the EU need to come to terms right now in the way it deals with its African partners, but also with its Asian partners or Latin American partners. One of the countries that is going to be steering that cooperation in coming months is Germany because it is now uh, has taken over as head of the EU's rotating presidency. Now, Chancellor Angela Merkel has said that the sustainable development goals will be serving as a compass. I spoke to the parliamentary state secretaries heading Germany's delegation to the United Nations high level political forum. And I asked them whether short term crisis management and climate protection can truly be easily combined in practice. Die Covid-19 Pandemie hat auch uns in Deutschland gezeigt, dass eine Transformation unserer Gesellschaft und Wirtschaft hin zu einer gestärkten Widerstandsfähigkeit und Zukunftsfähigkeit dringend notwendig ist. Und äh, im Konjunkturprogramm der Bundesregierung nehmen deshalb Zukunftsinvestitionen und Investitionen in Klimatechnologien im Sinne auch des European Green Deal eine zentrale Rolle ein. Es ist so gestaltet, dass sich unsere Wirtschaft nicht nur erholen kann, sondern dass sie klimafreundlicher und nachhaltiger aus der Krise hervorgeht. Deutschland wird sich weiter für eine nachhaltige Ausgestaltung des wirtschaftlichen Neustarts einsetzen, sowohl bei uns in Deutschland, aber natürlich auch international. Viele Länder im globalen Süden kämpfen mit den wirtschaftlichen Folgen der Pandemie. Deswegen komme ich noch einmal zurück auf die Worte der Kanzlerin, dass die Nachhaltigkeitsziele der Kompass für die Erholung sein müssten. Sind diese Ziele für solche schwer getroffenen Länder nicht eventuell ein Luxus? Nein, sie sind absolut kein Luxus. Das Gegenteil ist der Fall. Sie sind der Pfad zum Ausweg aus dieser Krise. Sehen Sie, wir haben gesehen, dass zum Beispiel der Verlust von Biodiversität einer der hauptsächlichen Ursachen ist, 
für diese schlimme Krise. Wir sehen, dass schwache Gesundheitssysteme, aber auch schwache Wirtschaftssysteme letztendlich die Folgen dieser Pandemie ja noch mal gravierender macht. Dass eine schwerwiegende Folge der Krise der Hunger ist, der wieder um sich greift, also die Bekämpfung von Hunger und Armut, der Aufbau resilienter Gesundheitssysteme, aber auch der Aufbau resilienter Wirtschaftssysteme, Lieferketten, die fair sind, sind absolut zentral, um die Folgen der Krise abzumildern, aber dann auch aus der Krise zu kommen bzw. neue Krisen zu vermindern. Vielen herzlichen Dank an Sie beide. Vielen Dank, Frau Green. Let me come to you, Sunita uh, Narayan, and ask you now about global leadership as we uh, deal with the pandemic and the twin uh, crisis of the climate. You have said that you severely criticize the post postponing of the COP26 meeting, the climate negotiations that were supposed to happen this year and have been put off to next. Are we lacking the kind of leadership that we need at international level? I mean, Melinda, it's really, uh, it, should, it, shouldn't, it should worry us today. I mean, what you're seeing today are multiple crises. And each crisis tells us that we cannot walk alone. We cannot work alone. I mean, we live in an interdependent, interconnected world at a scale that we have never seen before. I mean, just think about it. I mean, take the COVID-19 uh, pandemic today. I mean, we had SARS in 2004. At that time, the world was not so interconnected. Now, you get something happen in Wuhan, and within months, it's brought the whole world to its knees. I mean, we need global leadership at this point. And what you are seeing today is weak global institutions. And I would put WHO, UNFCC, and the UN in it. But let's not stop there. I mean, the fact today is India is facing one of the worst crises because of a locust attack. And that locust attack is directly linked to climate change because of the changes and the intensification of cyclones we have seen. But there's nothing India can do about it on its own. The fact is the breeding grounds for locusts are both in the Horn of Africa and in the Arabian Peninsula which means that we need to work together as countries. And then, of course, you have climate change, you have air pollution. So between the virus, the pollutant, and the emissions, the one thing that we are told today is that we cannot walk alone. We have to have leadership at the global level. And look, just look how pathetic, weak, and completely compromised the global leadership is. It's time they learned to talk truth to power. It is time that the global leadership understood the crises that, that the young people in the world are talking about, the crisis of climate change, the worry, the fear, and they learned to talk and to walk the talk on it. Yeah, in one I sentence, if you, it, it, just in one sentence, if you would, Sunita, what would you want to see from Europe, from Germany, as head of the EU's rotating council presidency? I certainly want Germany and Europe to get its voice back. I mean, what we have seen in the last some years is the weakening of Europe and the weakening of, therefore, the global compact. And I think we need to, somebody needs to bell the cat. I don't know who. But somebody needs to start talking about the need for much more decisive action. I mean, you look at these, I mean, I, I'm not under, undermining them, but please, I mean, I've been in this for too long, so forgive me. But the talk shops of the UN have to stop. You have to talk about hard action and you have to hold, you can't hold governments accountable, but governments must know that there is a leadership up there that they're all part of. And they're, we're, they're going to work as a community of nations and not as nations alone. I mean, you've just heard the minister talking so clearly about the crisis of finance and debt and the possibility to look for answers. There are answers there, but they're tough ones. So let's also understand the time for this genteel talk and nice little conferences is over. Uh, Sunita Narayan, you talked about, uh, of course, 
climate change being at the heart of it all. And if you talk about climate change, you talk about fossil fuels. I know that at the outset of this crisis, Nigeria scrapped subsidies uh, on fuel. Um, Ghana has only a decade ago started tapping into its own oil resources. Is the answer, well, uh, Kenaforiata, to leave that oil in the ground? <laughs> um, that's a very difficult one. Um, um, but, you know, we have been able to um, sort of ring fence our oil. Uh, receipts so that we don't um, look to depend on it as much as other countries do. Uh, Because truly, um, the issue of technology and entrepreneurship um, for people, I think is much more important. And that is where you you get to appreciating um, that even some of these like oil and does not give the type of jobs that you, you need for your people. And so we are shifting away from dependence on that. Now, the, the, the truth of the matter is that you look at an economy um, like Singapore and you say, well, where is the oil? It is all about the capacity of the human being. And that is where our president is. You know, train your people, their minds, their capacity, find resources for them so they can be entrepreneurs so that they're dependent on these resources and really the power of the people is what we are going to build our nations on. Um, so yes, we will err on the side of building our people. Francois Germain, the final word to you. By the way, Francois, I went to fill my, uh, my tank with gas the other day and I noticed the price of oil is starting to creep back up. Well, I, I think it's a good illustration. I mean, initially in a crisis, we might have thought that this would mean good news for climate change and good news for the environment, but I think that we shouldn't be fooled by the short-term effects of the crisis. And I'm concerned that, yes, in the long term, this might end up a disaster for climate change. And of course, the U.S. generation will be most affected. And we need to recognize that they've made a huge sacrifice during the COVID crisis. We know that the youth were less affected by the disease, were less infected by the virus, but we know that they will be more affected by the impacts of climate change. So we need to be extra careful that they don't end up being punished by the recession and by climate change at the same time. That would be very unfair for the young generation. A strong last message there from Francois Germain and much food for thought from all of you. Many, many thanks to our guests for being with us here on the debate. Many thanks to all of those who are following us online and at the United Nations High Level Political Forum. Hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.